Good evening, everyone, and welcome. It's just wonderful to have all of you here tonight, and the room is completely full, which is a fantastic thing to see. Um, this is my maiden voyage, as Corey mentioned. This is my first, uh, my first event as the CEO of the museum, and I just couldn't be happier to be doing it on this event tonight because it represents so much of what the museum stands for. Now, the reason I'm down here and not up there is that uh, our speaker tonight, Richard Tedlow, is also going to be down here. So we're kind of getting you warmed up with somebody who's down on the floor as opposed to up on the podium. This is not simply a lecture by Richard on the history of the IBM 360. This is an interactive presentation. And in fact, I think the more you could make it like a typical business school class that Richard might teach at Harvard, the happier he will be. So if you disagree, shout out the disagreement. If you have a question, don't hold up your hand. Just say, I have a question. Interrupt him. Make it interactive. Get Richard's juices flowing, which won't be too hard to do, uh, having seen him go through this today. And let's make this a really fun and interactive evening, because I guarantee you, this is somebody with the background and the intellect to be reckoned with. And I think the more we kind of tussle together tonight, the more fun it'll be for all of us. So with that, let me just please introduce to you tonight's speaker, Professor Richard Tedlow. Well, thanks, thanks very much. It's, it's, uh, it's a delight to be here. And let me say uh, to th those of you who uh, I had the pleasure of having as students that if you do shout out, I'll change your transcripts. And, uh, <laughs> um, uh, but uh, this, is, this is a, uh, a session about history. But before I get going, I want to say that there are a couple of people in here who've made history. Uh, and one of them is right over here, and his name is Jerry Spigals. And I wonder if you'd just be good enough to stand up for a second. Jerry uh, is <laughs> Jerry is an alum of IBM. And Jerry, in in November and December of 1961, where were you? On the spread committee. Jerry was on the spread committee. And the spread committee was the committee that wrote the report that was presented to T. Vincent Learson. My recollection is it's on January 4th, 1962. That may be correct, but it was incorrect. It was sometime that winter. And that was the report that got the, the 360 going, basically. That was the sales report. Jerry was in that motel in Coscob, Connecticut, with, was it 12 people? 12 people total. They wrote this report, and this report is a, it's an icon of computer history. A copy's in the museum. A copy's in the museum. You can see it for a, uh, for a small charge. We also have Jean Amdahl here. Jean, would you be good enough to stand up? Uh, this is one reason why this is not going to, my presentation is not going to be about the technology of the IBM 360. Uh, um, if you have a question about it, you can ask him. Um, so uh, let me begin by asking you, how many people in this room did not see the Wall Street Journal today? Just a show of hands. How many did not see it? So most of you didn't see it. I want to show you the front page. You know, this is at no cost to you. Uh, I want to show you the front page, and I want, I want to know what your reaction is. One reaction is, I don't think so. I didn't get that version. You didn't get that version. So you, you read the Wall Street Journal, and you missed this one. No, I see. Uh, can you all read it? Because if you can't, uh, from back there, can you read this? Seriously, um, what it says is, Schmidt leaves Google for Microsoft. Tech wor world Wall Street stunned as Balmer steps down. Google's biggest search ever. High stakes quest for Schmidt's successor may take months. Uh, and since this is an interactive presentation, and there's actually a reason that I'm starting this way, let me ask you, and we'll take this on a shouting out basis, and I'll repeat it, and I'll ask our scribe to put the name up. Who should be the CEO of Google now that Schmidt is gone? <laughs> Dave. <laughs> House. H-O-U-S-E. Okay. Uh, he, turned it, he turned it down? 
He tur- I did turn it down. Oh, did you really? <laughs> Is that right? That's interesting. Balmer. Balmer? <laughs> Balmer, B-A-L-L-M-E-R. It's a media job. I see. So should it be jobs? If it's a media job, should it be Steve Jobs? Okay, jobs, J-O-B-S. Uh, okay, we, look, we need somebody to run Google. Schmidt's going up to uh, Yang. 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 Uh, before I say anything, may I ask, is Mr. Yang here? Um, is Sue Decker here? She isn't? Okay. She was a former student. Um, uh, who else? Shaila Shra, are you, is that you? Yes. Uh, hi, how are you? <laughs> Put that up. Uh, R-A-O, R-A-O. We're in fiction anyway, so watch it. That's not the spirit that made America great, Shailesh. <laughs> I, Shailesh was a student uh, who was, it's one of, the, one of the reasons you become a professor is, is, is so you hope that someone like Shaila Shrau winds up in your class. And there was a moment that I had in, with him in class that I, I'll remember and cherish till the day I die. Um, there, there was uh, someone said something in class that was just really stupid. And um, uh, when you're at, 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 at the Harvard Business School, you're not supposed to say that. You're supposed to say, are there other views? You know, are there other views? And um, because, you know, the whole, the whole idea is you're supposed to make them feel good and then they give you high ratings. That's the game. <laughs> um, but but, but this, this was just so, uh, I, I looked at the guy and I said, why don't you just ask me whether there's life after death? <laughs> and Shailesh Rao stood up and said, there is. Uh, <laughs> and um, that was a surprise. It was a beautiful moment. Any other names come to mind? How about John Chambers? Seriously. W- what do you think? No? Why? Y- yeah, but you don't think Google would be a step up? Is he in this room now? Um, pardon me? He's not a media guy. Is he a tech guy? He's a salesman? Is that what I heard? He's not a tech guy. He's a salesman? I'm terribly sorry. Speak up a little bit. Put Chambers up there. Uh, now we've got, do we have any more room or is this it? Yes, sir. Carly uh, Fiorina. <laughs> Scott Cook. Uh, Bob Iger. Bob Iger, I-G-E-R. Meg Whitman. Well, well now, now let me ask you a question. Of these people, um, are these people all tech people in your view? So, you, so some people are saying that you don't need to be a high-tech maven to run a high-tech company. Is that what I'm hearing from the group? Yeah, do you agree? Let me ask, does anybody agree with that statement? You do not have to be a high-tech expert to run a high-tech company. Yes. You agree with it? Gene Omdahl agrees with it. Uh, uh, somebody over here who agrees with it. Just tell me why, why, sir. Could you stand up and tell me why? He's a super salesman. So. Lou Gerstner, which would be another interesting choice, actually, if we, we reeled back, say, 20 years uh, for this job. Gerstner. I'm Jack Welch. Well, Jack Welch was a Ph.D. in chemical, uh, chemical engineering, wasn't he? So, but that's not, he's not this kind of tech. Welch is a name that I was expecting would go up there soon, and I was kind of surprised that no one mentioned it. Uh, oh, it's West Coast, yeah. I'm sorry. I take it back. I take it back. Uh, today, uh, <laughs> yeah, I noticed that. Well, no. No, they're not from California. They, um, they don't get the vote. No, I, uh, you know, I come to California periodically, and I think that Americans should be required to have a visa before they come out here. Um, uh, it's a very... It's, I see. <laughs> I see. It's a strange world. Uh, anyway, the, the, the... I'm sorry? 
No, not, not here. No, why should they? Um, uh, I'm just saying that if this, should, if this headline should come true, and since I think Eric Schmidt owns, what, $6 billion worth of Google or some number like that, or call, it, call it 12. Um, uh, it's, um, he, it's, he's wealthier than I am. That's confidential. Um, uh, the, the chances of that headline being true are indeed slender. But it is interesting to think, who would you put in that position? And how much does tech matter? Because the story you're going to hear tonight is the story of a company that, from a technological standpoint, comes out with the masterpiece of the 20th century, you could argue. Certainly, uh, it's been argued that it's one of the two greatest new product introductions of the 20th century. The first was the Model T Ford, and the second was the IBM 360. And yet the CEO of the company, the sine qua non, the man who had to say go or no go, was a non-tech guy. He was a salesman, and his father was a salesman, and he was from a company that was a sales company. And I, that's just in, very intriguing to me because he's the one who had to be telling Bob Evans, he's the one who had to be telling uh, Fred Brooks, you know, do this, do that, without knowing whether or not it was possible. You know, you, go build a tower to the moon. <laughs> I mean, you know, can these things be done? Um, I don't know. Uh, but let's take a look for a moment at the story. And I think that if we can go back to the thank you. That was, I appreciate that. Uh, going back to the, um, the PowerPoint, you can't understand this story, the 360 story, unless you, understand, you have some sort of sense of the industry, some sort of sense of the company, and I'm going to dwell on that a lot here, the company. I believe some sort of sense of the family because I think the dynamic between father and son, who the son was, Tom Jr. This company had two CEOs from 1914 to 1971, T.J. Sr. and T.J. Jr. Uh, and then finally the machine. Uh, you have to understand the company and the family, or you can't understand the machine, at least in speaking as an historian, that's how it looks to me. Now, I'm not going to go through all these dates, but I just want to point out a few of them quickly to you. This company was founded as a, an unrelated diversifier, a conglomerate that didn't make any sense in 1911, uh, called Computing, Tabulating, and Recording. The CEO was a man named George Fairchild, who was a Republican congressman from New York State and who knew absolutely nothing about anything. Uh, <laughs> why does that matter? Does anybody happen to know who George Fairchild's son was? Sherman, Sherman Fairchild. And, that's, and it was out of, you know, so the answer is, if you want to be a success in tech, run for the Congress from an upper New York State district as a Republican. They chose George Fairchild. He got a great deal of money for being CEO of IBM for a couple of years. Um, and Sherman Fairchild, Fairchild Cameron's, and Semiconductor came out of. That's the money. That's where that money came from. Uh, so it's good to be in the right place at the right time. Tom Watson, Jr., Sr., excuse me, becomes CEO in 1914 of computing, tabulating, and recording. And Watson is a man with a lot on his mind. He has already been convicted of antitrust violations because of his work at the National Cash Register Company, and he's facing a year in jail and a $5,000 fine. And that's when he's hired. <laughs> and in his interview with the board, the first question he gets is, um, who's going to run this company while you're serving your year in jail? <laughs> this is called a stress interview. Um, and the next question was, why did you leave the National Cash Register Company? And the answer was because Mr. Patterson, John Patterson, asked for my resignation. Strike two. Okay, in that case, we'll hire you. Um, <laughs> anyway, he beats the rap, and, but, and so that's why his title changes to gen, from general manager to president. IBM doesn't change from computing, tabulating, recording uh, to, to international business machines until 1924. It takes him a year to do that, and he understands he has this blinding insight. Computing, tabulating, and recording made a whole bunch of things, time clocks, butcher scales, uh, cats and dogs. But they also, uh, they also made – computing was not the, um, the genesis of the computer. It's tabulating that was. That was Herman Hollerith's company, and that did the census. And Tom Watson understood something. You know, one blinding insight will cover a lot of sins which is that in the 20th century, business is going to be about information. 
So although Tabulating was the smallest of these three companies in 1914, when he became CEO by 1933, it was the biggest. And IBM went into this business, you know, like gangbusters. And then when Social Security came along, there all of a sudden became an enormous, this is in 1935, governmentally imposed uh, need for businesses to process whole new rafts of information, and IBM was there with their punch cards. So um, I'm, I, I'm, I know I'm supposed to look at this and not to look at that, because if I look at that, they're taking the back of my head, and, and this is being filmed, and I'm bad. You know, right? I'm now looking at this. There's the camera. I acknowledge that. Um, uh, to the best of my knowledge, the first email ever was sent in 1939. Uh, why bring that up? Because technology casts a long shadow. Uh, and um, there are things like that around now, which people are saying 20, they'll, we'll, they'll say 20 or 30 or 40 years from now, why didn't they see that? Why didn't they recognize what the importance of that was? Um, uh, TJ uh, Jr. joins the company before uh, World War II. Um, he's very dissatisfied. He's the oldest of the four children. He's the first son. The youngest is the, is the second son. There are two daughters in between. And uh, Jane, the daughter Jane, is Senior's favorite child. And he always had a very scratchy relationship with T.J. Jr., with his son. And Dick Watson, who was the youngest, um, uh, in a Darwinian family was the one who got eaten up, and part of that is, is part of the 360 story. This is a family drama. It's a family saga in addition to everything else. Um, anyway, Watson is a playboy, drinks, flies his own plane, life is sweet, he's rich, um, goes away, grows up in the Army, comes back, goes to work at IBM, thinks he's going to move right to the top, but he doesn't. There's a man named Charlie Kirk in his way. He has a fight with Charlie Kirk the night of the fight, not a physical fight, but a shouting match the night of the shouting match, uh, Kirk has a heart attack, fatal. Um, IBM is a high stakes game. Um, uh, anyway, um, uh, IBM announces the System 360 on April 7th, 1964. That's when uh, T. Vincent Lerson made that, uh, no, it must have been Watson. Watson, excuse me, made the announcement. He made it in Poughkeepsie. He, they had a train, a special car, 200. Uh, I, they were not, uh, no? Did he make it in Endicott? Did they have a train with media people come up from New York City? But they did it at the annual stockholders meeting. Is that right, really? So the announcement was at the annual stockholders meeting at Endicott. But I understand there were meetings all around the world also simultaneously. Been, but the original announcement was there. Uh, but they were not hiding their light under a bushel. My under, uh, so anyway, what was the result of the 360? Well. By 1979, IBM was the company of companies in the industry of industries. Make a long story short. It's really true. Um, this is Watson's TJ Sr.'s father. He's from uh, Steuben County, uh, East Campbell, New York. In other words, nowhere. Um, and the only piece of advice he gives to, and his son, Tom Sr., says, at one point, I'm, I, I, I was a better man than my father. I knew it, and I knew that I, if I called upon to prove it, I could prove it. Um, and I wonder if T.J. Sr. was thinking that T.J. Jr. was thinking the same thing about him. This is Painted Post. I, I, I went there in 2001, took this picture because of uh, seeing this picture. This is the Watson family, and some people in this room know both Watson, uh, knew, knew both Watson Sr. and Jr., and this is Painted Post, and there's Sr. right in the, in the center. This is the schoolhouse where he uh, was trained. Um, he was a school teacher for a grand total of one day. Uh, he couldn't do a really tough job. Uh, here you see him as a school kid, a school child. He's in the middle in the back. Tom uh, Sr., this is. And we're moving along. Here he is as a young salesperson. And early in his career with CTR, computing, tabulating, and recording. Here he is with his wife, his sister, and his mother on the lower right. And um, he was a man who always came up with these formulations, like, um, uh, Organization is a man proposition. The man adjur, the general man adjur, service man. It sounds hokey, ridiculous, and wacko, but it worked. Um, so uh, there's something to be said for that. Here is Tom uh, uh, Sr. at when he's still at National Cash Register. 
And it's a classic Tom Senior pose. And if you can see, some of you can, some of you can't on the right, it says do right. Um, and uh, now we're going to go into the CTR, uh, the, the next one. So listen carefully, uh, if you would, uh, to the, uh, if we can go now to the CTR, um, that's what should happen, right? I should go to the next slide and the one after this one? Now. Turn to page five. Page five in the songbook. We'll do one verse and two choruses of Ever Onward on page five. Now, listen the to the lyrics. <laughs> Just out of curiosity, does anybody in this room remember that tune a little bit? Okay, some do. I should have asked you to come forward. You could have been a chorus here. Um, why play that? Why does this matter? Because IBM practiced a form of management that they called contention management. There was a lot of inner tension in this firm. And you needed a glue to hold together the, the stuff that got people angry at one another and tearing each other apart. And part of that was this in, in, incredibly strong culture that this firm built up over decades. So I think that you, I, I think that, it, you know, I'm not sure. You know, there's a very famous story about Bob Evans and Fred Brooks, and I'm anxious to be corrected about this. And the story is that Bob Evans was one of the great champions of the 360, and Fred Brooks, who wrote The Mythical Man Month, a book that some of you probably are familiar with, was opposed to it. He wanted to go to the 8,000. And there was a big argument, contention management, this, that. And after Evans won, he put Brooks in charge of the software for the 360. That's the kind of glue that existed in this company. Well, I'm wrong again, Gene. So what we're hearing is that Bob Evans was originally in favor of the 8,000. Gene was consulted about this and said it wasn't, it wasn't the home run that IBM felt that it needed to hit. Um, uh, so let's go on. This is the first IBM. Uh, this is at Endicott. This is their uh, training building uh, for sales training. And this is TJ Sr. with the famous uh, think sign, and Dave, now do I ask them to uh, play the, uh, if you play, now once again, I want you to listen carefully to this. If you play the next. And we must study through reading, listening, discussing, observing, and thinking. We must not neglect any one of those ways of study. The trouble with most of us is that we fall down on the left, think, because it's hard work for people to think. And as Dr. Nicholas Murray Butler said recently, all of the problems of the world could be settled easily if men were only willing to think. I'm sorry about the quality of that recording. It was made in 1915. Um, it's all about thinking. People have to think. They don't think enough. 
it's very strange to me, once again, I mean, what are you supposed to think about? Uh, I mean, and who could be opposed to that? All those who are uh, opposed to thinking, please raise your hand. Okay, well, we have one Republican here. Okay. Uh, 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 but once again, this, this was, uh, this photograph, which is a Karsh photograph, was an icon. The whole world knew this. And the whole world knew so much about Think that they poked fun of it. So here you see Think, Think Big, Scheme. I mean, it, was, it became part of both American and global culture. There was Think or Swim, think or swim uh, which was another problem that uh, you could have. So um, this is Endicott. Uh, each year, Dad, this is from Tom Watson Jr.'s um, autobiography, each year, Dad pulled out all the stops for the 100% club. If you'd made 100% of your quota or more, you got to go to Endicott and play golf and relax and enjoy life. But I, I think not drink, right? I don't think that, uh, yeah, no alcohol. Um, and here, uh, you see something else, and this is really very important, because this was part of IBM's great lock-in for years and years and, and years, this is service. And Dave, once again, is this, whose voice are we going to hear now? Is it, this is Tom Watson Jr. talking about service since 1993, so shortly before his death. He died on December 31st, 1993. This is Tom Watson Jr. talking about what service meant at IBM. So if we could play that, I'd appreciate it. I think that, uh, that you have to have more than just a machine. Other people could build the hardware, I knew that, properly financed and properly led and driven and uh, with sufficient ambition to get where they wanted to go, they could build the hardware. But that idea of service was so ingrained in every one of us that there wasn't any of us who wouldn't jump out of bed and uh, go try to pacify a customer or get out a payroll account or anything else. As you get old, you, you tend to take everybody's good ideas that they whispered to you and think that you concocted them yourself. But uh, it, it, whoever's idea it was, it was a great ad. It, it was a full-page ad in most uh, newspapers in America, and it just said IBM means service. Hopefully cutting-edge equipment, hopefully all sorts of pioneering efforts, hopefully Nobel Prizes. But the service is something that most companies forget. I'm going to just said Ivy. It's a sales and service company. Did you hear him say, hopefully Nobel Prizes, hopefully cutting edge this, hopefully that, but sales and service above all. And so it's interesting that this utterly cutting edge machine, the IBM 360, should come from IBM. This, uh, this completely sales oriented tech firm run by a salesperson. Um, uh, so this is father and son, and you can, you know, the, the body language in the face says it all. I mean, um, uh, they didn't get along from an early age, and um, uh, they fought a lot. Here's the son um, on the cover of Time magazine, and he was afraid his father would be jealous of him. This is a famous photograph. This is Tom Watson Sr. literally handing the company over to Tom Watson Jr. on May 8, 1956. Uh, and Senior, you, you tell me what his face says. You tell me what Junior's face says. Um, uh, Senior died six weeks after this picture was taken. He died June 19th. He had an intestinal obstruction. According to what I've read, it was operable, but he said, it's enough. You know, it reminds me of George Eastman, who literally committed suicide. He shot himself in the heart and he left his suicide note, which is, my work is over, why wait? And it was almost as if Watson will this. At least that's the view of, of some people, and, uh, including his, his own son. Um, here, uh, this is San Jose, and, and here uh, is TJ Jr., who is almost criminally handsome, uh, as you can see on the left, uh, accompanied by the, uh, the then commie in chief of the Earth, Nikita Khrushchev. And this is you know, right down here in San Jose. And um, uh, now, why do the 360? Here's IBM's performance uh, in 19, from 1950 to 1961. Uh, 1956 is the year that Junior gets the company. 
1957, IBM breaks the billion-dollar barrier. So it takes them about 45 years to become a billion-dollar company. It takes them four years to become a $2 billion company. Now, given this kind of performance, why, why, if this was a bet the company operation, and a lot of people take issue with that formulation, and we can talk about that, why do it? Is this the time to bet the company when you've got numbers that look like this? Um, uh, at the time, this is this TAY's Fortune article that some of you may have read. At the time, it scarcely seemed that any gamble at all was necessary. IBM was way out ahead of the competition and looked as if it could continue smoothly in its old ways forever. So why do this, therefore? Um, IBM's 360 project ultimately cost 1.9 times the company's revenue for the year in which it was launched, in which the Learson said go ahead, which was 1962. The company's revenue that year uh, multiplied times 1.9 is what the 360 cost. And you're, this is a leap into the unknown. Is this kind of compatibility that they're going for really? Yes, sir. You know, I, I'm just a school teacher. You know, I, it looks like money to me. Uh, but you know what? Their percentage by which they were growing was slowing. Um, and, um, you know, what would, but let's just take a look at the investment. It, well, this thing wound up costing them $5 billion. What would, that in, what would equivalent investments look like today? It would mean that Google would invest $32 billion you know, to develop something in four years that nobody ever heard of and might work and might not. And to replace it and, and would, would obsolete its existing product line. Because that's what IBM did. I mean, with the 360, the 1401, the 7020, those were all boom, toast. Those numbers, margins notwithstanding, they would all, you wouldn't have any margin problem because you'd have no income. <laughs> uh, you know, so, um, Walmart, if it were Walmart, it would be like Walmart saying, we're going to invest $720 billion, and there won't be any more Walmarts. There's going to be something new, you know, the computer history mart or something like that, you know, uh, located on a space station, and it'll only cost us $720 billion. Uh, uh, so uh, why, do you, why, do you suppose, why do you suppose they did this? I'm asking, and I honestly don't know. Yes, sir. The right people listen. Uh, the right people listen. Can, can we go to the scribe part of this without make? I'm sorry? The right people listened to the right engineers, and the right management happened. So we've got three rights people, engineer, and engineers, and management. Somehow, the engineers got to the managers, and the managers were smart enough to listen to the right ones. And then they were smart enough to sell it. I'm terribly sorry. They, then they were also smart enough to sell it. They, were, they gave it to the right salespeople. Selling was always IBM's fort. Yes. To get their internal costs under control. To get their internal costs under control. What internal costs were out of control? So let's add internal costs. Oh, I see. So it's, it's, it's the internal, and this is what uh, Mr. Amdahl was saying uh, to me. If you've got five or six or seven totally different computing networks, if that's the proper systems. I'm sorry? Families. Families. Each with several generations. Each with several generations, each needing its own complete support software and service. And guys on gondolas. I mean, think of the fleet of gondolas. You know, they get... Uh, um, <laughs> So why else? Yes. Create a monopoly. Always a good reason. Monopoly. Monopoly. Uh, back here. Yes, sir. Okay. Scalability. Let's talk about that for a moment. Let's just let's just let's stall out on this. You said, sir, that the customers didn't have scalability. Let me ask a question. So what? So what? Why is that important? They, 
Customer lock-in. Sir, what does that mean, customer lock-in? If it's the 360, but if it's the old system of, uh, of silos, every time the customer has to upgrade, he can start looking at Honeywell, he can look at RCA, and all those also-rans might not look like so much also-rans. Yes, sir? Can I offer an observation? Uh, yeah, it's a free country. Ben Learson was in charge of marketing, and before the 360, we had six different product lines, and you were lucky if the salesman knew one. Oh. And Ben Learson said, I want the salesman to know the whole product line. Therefore, I want a product line which is understandable by all of the salespeople. And that meant they have to be <laughs> We found Google CEO. We found. <laughs> We've got our answer. Yes, uh, Mr. Not downward compatible. And so, to take advantage of what was added, you had to redo many of your applications, which meant there was a big additional cost to the customer and made it sales much harder. So it made sales harder. First of all, people had to know a great deal about seven lines, and it made sales harder because any kind of change, any kind of upgrade, and this is at a time when office work in the United States is growing very fast. Yes, sir. A universal product that, that will, well, that's why they named it 360, because it will, it will uh, surround your data needs 360 degrees. Yes? Well, it's, it is a step function change in the whole industry. I mean, it's a, it's a revolution in the industry. And I, my late wife was a psychiatrist, and I like that explanation. Uh, what you just heard, what, what was just said was, does it have anything to do with T.J. Jr. making the company his own? Um, you know, I, I guess it's, it's nice to be born this rich, but it also can be a problem. And because T.J. Jr. is born with a problem, and that is a problem, an issue, and that issue is, can you top this? His father took a nothing, cats and dogs, meat slicers, scales, nothing, and turned into international business machines. Literally, you saw the handshake. He turns it over to his son. And his son, every year, would say, this is my third year without dad. This is my fourth year without dad. How am I doing? And the only way, I think, and this is, this is dime store psychology, but the only way that Junior felt that he could make a statement that, you know what, I could have made it on my own, was to come out with a machine that revolutionized the industry. Now, is, does, is that personal emotive that important in, in, in history? I think so. I mean, it's part of the mix. You know, IBM was till death do us part. Really, I'm not kidding. Yes. It still is. It still is. I'm terribly sorry, sir. Junior had to prove his dad wrong. Now we're getting, we're getting beyond psychiatry into psychoanalysis. You know, uh, if Freud were here, what would he say? Let's go back to, if, if we could, to the PowerPoint. Um, these are our, this is what it would mean for Google and for Walmart. Now, wh why else? Uh, I'm writing a book, and um, I'm, I've got chapters on IBM and on Sears. Around the time that IBM decided to go with the 360, Sears had, um, a couple of years later, certainly, very major competition, but it didn't recognize it. And that Sears was alone at the head of the class. Sears was to general merchandise retailing what IBM was to computing. And Sears, instead of inventing Walmart, let Sam Walton do that. And instead, Sears built a tower. <laughs> I mean, uh, no, I mean, the CEO of Sears at the time the tower was built was a man named Gordon Metcalf, and it was known as Gordon Metcalf's Last Erection. It was this gigantic tower <laughs> that, that, was, that was put up um, in Chicago. <clears throat> and if you read Arthur Martinez's book about, you know, they, they, we had to get out of the tower. Companies that lose their way build monuments to themselves. 
Uh, and yet IBM wasn't going to be Sears. IBM understood that the biggest risk, especially in tech, is doing nothing. I don't think that they, uh, I, I, my problem with the bet the company thing is I, I don't know how this was budgeted. I don't know if anybody sat down and said, here's an idea, let's risk everything. I think that, I think this turned out to be a lot harder than anybody thought it was going to be when they first, when that spread report was first put before Vincent Learson. They didn't know what they didn't know. Um, uh, at the time, it scarcely seemed necessary. You've seen this quote before, but below the surface, IBM's organization didn't fit the changing markets. Um, <coughs> excuse me, so neatly anymore, and there really was, in Bob Evans's phrase, a risk involved in doing nothing. And that's a risk that too many businesses, tech or non-tech, are too willing to take. The risk of doing nothing. Now, this is the IBM product line basically before the 360, and the problem is that the, these machines didn't talk to each other. They weren't compatible, the salesperson hadn't learned them all, there were a whole fleet of gondolas going to Venice to try to you know, figure out what to do about it. And this is an interesting picture because this is at the height of the 360 crisis in 1965. You know, what was the 360 crisis? It was multi-fold. There was tremendous software problems in getting the operating system done, getting it done on time. Remember the song about service? We've got to do service. You're, IBM, you know, no, the oldest saying in the world in, in, in tech is that nobody ever got fired for buying IBM. And yet here they are shipping stuff that they're not 100% you know, sure is right. They also had to go into manufacturing all new kinds of microelectronics, for example, that they were not um, in the business of doing. I mean, my understanding is that $3 billion of that $5 billion was in manufacturing facilities that were, and they hired something like 120,000 people. The thing was much bigger than anybody thought. And um, this is Watson Jr., closest to you, his brother is uh, third from your right, and his brother was running IBM World Trade. He was called back to Armonk to help with the 360. He failed in his task, and <coughs> that failure essentially cost him his career at IBM. And his brother, Tom Watson Jr., felt guilty about that for the rest of his life. It's a high-stakes game. Um, and here is what wound up happening. Here you see Watson and Learson uh, together with the System 360, uh, which is uh, so much flowed from this. Among the things that flowed from this is that you wish that you had bought IBM in 1979, or excuse me, 1959, and sold it in 1969. I mean, this is this. I mean, this really does move the, the needle on the meter of life. There's the market. There are the seven competitors, and there is IBM. One of the things IBM was, my understanding, very concerned about, we talked about this briefly prior to the start, was that GE, which was a Fortune 5 company and had plenty of electronics ability, was going to come in and hire the best of IBM's engineers and hire them away. And in fact, Hanstro was hired by GE. And, uh, but now, you know, by, as a result of the 360, this is a non-problem. A non I want to say a couple of words in Conclusion, Kare is, where is Kare? So am, am I sort of on time? I'm doing great. I'm not, people aren't walking out, they're not leaving. You're not unhappy? Okay. Um, Tom Watson had a heart attack in 19, it was either 1970 or 71, I can't remember. And during his convalescence, I think he was in the hospital for 20 days. Can you imagine that? Uh, you know, these days, they, you know, you stop by for about 10 seconds, they get out. Um, <laughs> Um, but uh, his doctor, who played the role of psychiatrist to some extent to him, said, you know, why keep doing this to yourself? You know, wh and Watson made the decision to leave the active management of the company, although he hovered. I mean, Lou Gerstner, when he became CEO, found Watson in the back seat of his car once, and he said, save my company. It's true. <laughs> Take a look at Gerstner's book. Uh, this was in 1993. Um, so uh, he was very much still around and very much still... The IBM religion was so ingrained in him that this following story is a story that Watson Jr. himself tells, and it says a lot about IBM. Watson Jr. became the uh, ambassador to the then Soviet Union in 1979 when Jimmy Carter was president. Um, and this is a tough job. I mean, this is the Soviet Union. All they have is 10,000 nuclear warheads. I mean, this is, you know, this is a tough time. 
Um, whether this is a good idea for a man who's concerned about his cardiac uh, <laughs> health, but you know, he took the job. And this was the time when the Russians, or the Soviets, I should say, invaded Afghanistan. And uh, imagine being the ambassador to the Soviet Union when the Soviets invade Afghanistan. It's a, all of a sudden, it's the 360 all over again, except it's global, and this is a, you know, an industrial strength problem. And what you can't read at the bottom it says, when the Soviets invaded Afghanistan in late 1979, I, Tom Jr., was called back to Washington to meet with President Carter, who's on your right, and Cyrus Vance, who's the Secretary of State, and to have uh, conferences. And here is what Tom Watson Jr. remembers, and this is the impact of IBM on T.J. Jr. The President called me back to Washington and I joined the White House consultations about how the United States should respond. Carter was determined to make the Soviets pay for their aggression. The White House and State Department made up a long list of possible anti-Soviet moves. My own embassy, the U.S. Embassy in Moscow, contributed a number of suggestions and in the end the President decided to adopt almost every one of them. That meant taking apart practically all the cooperative arrangements we had with the Russians under detente. Some of you in this room are old enough to remember what that means. Uh, from art exhibitions to new sales of grain and boycotting the Moscow Olympics. Imagine the gesture it would have been if, if the President Bush had boycotted the, the Beijing Olympics. You know, that the Chinese wouldn't have gotten involved in the next Treasury auction and we all would be broke. Um, <laughs> Um, there wasn't much I could add to the discussion. Take this in, folks. I didn't make this up. I'm not that clever. The only time I spoke up was to object to a particular trade, to, to particular trade sanctions that went too far. For example, American companies had delivered manufacturing equipment to Russia and now they weren't even going to be allowed to send spare parts to fix equipment that was still under warranty. <laughs> you saw the service. IBM means service. I told the president, this didn't make sense. These are direct quotes. Take this one in. If you want to declare war, World War III, and turn the world into a sun or have a boycott, fine. I'm willing to forget about it if you are. But breaking a commitment to a customer is always good. That's what made IBM a great company, and I think a company that didn't have that kind of culture could never have done the 360. I just don't think they could have managed the contention involved. Um, uh, this is, uh, I'm not going to read you this whole thing. Uh, this is what Vincent Learson said about the mistakes when he was debriefing, the mistakes that he felt the, the company had made in the whole 360 operation. He said, we made two miscalculations, and I'm, I am going to take the trouble to read the stuff that's in bold face because I do think it's an important lesson. We made two miscalculations. We were off on our assessment of the 360's potential reception. It was much more popular than anybody thought. That IBM couldn't service the demand. And we were off on our assessment of IBM's production capability to meet the demand. So they had to become manufacturers on a scale that was new to them. Billions of dollars were spent on this. And programming, that's the software part, programming system 360 presented a particularly formidable challenge. We did what Charles Kettering, who invented the electric self-starter, an engineering genius and president of the General Motors Research Division, always advised against. We put a delivery date on something yet to be invented. <laughs> and ever since he said that, that has never happened in this industry. <laughs> so that's Learson's take on the challenge that the reception was greater than they thought, the, 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 the manufacturing challenge was greater, and the software complexity was tougher than they had anticipated. And that's the problem with Bet the Company. I don't think they knew what they were, they didn't know what they didn't know. They didn't know what they were getting into. 
but it's a magnificent uh, story, nevertheless, of, of uh, this is still Learson. He says, the fact is IBM has been built on problems. It's a magnificent story of a magnificent business success that cost a lot of people a lot, but was a triumph. Um, and let me wind up with some final questions. Can you have a non-tech CEO for a high-tech company? The answer seems to be yes, if you have the right people listening to the right people. Uh, and, if, and if you at least know what you don't know. Um, uh, bet the company gambles. Who makes them? We were talking this morning about whether the 386 was a bet the company gamble for Intel. Um, I think very few companies that are doing well make them on purpose. <laughs> but I think the 360 story is the story of a company that bet the company by accident and won. I'm sorry? Uh, well, Boeing is actually, Learson makes the comparison to Boeing, and that's the closest one. The comment was Boeing does it or has done it multiple times. And, and that would, I think, be the quote. Can anybody else think of a company that's a leader that bets the company? Apple, but Apple was, uh, you know, Apple was having a hell of a time. I, you know, Apple is one of the life's great mysteries. Uh, <laughs> really, really. Amdahl bet the company the decisions. Intel. Intel, what specifically with regard, when did they do that? Microprocessor. Going with a microprocessor. That's a bet the company decision. I mean, you pull memories. Memories is what, are what made you great. You know, yes, sir. Is that right, really? My Lord. Uh, Schwab, he said, when Schwab bought its mainframe, if, I'm, if I caught you correctly, it was worth more than the company. That's a bet your company decision. Um, this is something very interesting to me. I'm writing a book about denial in business organizations, why business organizations don't look facts in the face. And the thing that I like about the 360 story is it's a story of getting it right. The fact is that underneath there were problems with IBM's product offering, even though they were leaders. That there's nothing that says, that nowhere is it written, you're going to be a leader forever. Um, and and they, they didn't deny the realities that, especially in tech, but in business in general, leadership's a moving target. They moved, I think they took a little bit bigger step than they thought they were going to, but they, did, they were not mired in denial like Sears was building its tower. Um, Andy Grove, with whom I had the pleasure of having dinner last night, um, said the most important role of managers is to create an environment in which people are passionately dedicated to winning in the marketplace. Fear plays a major role in creating and maintaining passion. And Andy was, I think, not bad at creating a master. Uh, this is Dave House, and, and he just said that Andy majored in fear when he went to CCNY. Um, Fear of competition, fear of bankruptcy, fear of being wrong, and fear of losing can all be powerful motivators. And Andy wrote this famous passage in a famous book, which was a bestseller, called Only the Paranoid Survive. And this is a quote from T.J. Jr. I hope. I'm, there it is. Fear of failure became the most powerful force in my life. So before Andy Grove, T.J. Jr. was saying, Fear of failure is what's motivating me, and the way to succeed, the, ro the route to success, is the 360, no, no matter how long and hard that r road may be. And there are people in this room who made it possible for that road to be paved. Thank you very much. John, you want to come forward? Or? You want to take a question or two? Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, you know that. Uh, uh, you know, I think the bundle of software with the hardware. I don't think the 360 could have been done otherwise. I think it had to be done within a corporation, and that was the way it was done. I mean, there there really wasn't. And I need someone's help here, but there really wasn't an independent software vending industry prior to the 360. Go ahead. Uh, there are about 10 or 12 of us together when IBM uh, announced to us that they were going to unbundle the software from the hardware, but I never heard them make a public announcement. Neither did the venture capitalists know this. 
But uh, the reason they gave was that uh, they were concerned that they might be sued for being uh, in violation of antitrust. Of antitrust laws. So that, that, that's the speculation, that it was not, uh, thank you very much, sir, that it was not strictly their choice. Um, and the unbundling, when you think about it, IBM and Apple took two diametrically opposed approaches to the PC business. I, you know, IBM basically was an assembler of, of Intel CPUs and DOS. And, excuse me, yes, that's right, and Apple is the classic walled garden, and both approaches failed. I mean, Apple has 7% of the computer market, and IBM isn't in the business anymore. So, Jerry, yes, uh, can, can we turn this mic on? Is it possible now to do this? I'd like to make two observations. In the picture with uh, Dick Watson and Tom Watson, yes. you missed two guys. A.K. Williams, Al Williams, Al Williams, was the financial genius behind that whole transition. And, of course, Ben Learson was the marketing genius. Those two guys just were just outstanding and really were the backbone of making the 360 happen. I'd like to tell you about one problem with the 360 that was very interesting. IBM salesmen are pretty clever. And when the 360 got announced, what they would immediately do, say the customer needed the mid-side machine, they would bid the lowest machine and say, well, if it doesn't work, we're compatible. And the, when it finally showed up, the customers were very unhappy because of the difference. So we had to slap on a procedure which basically assured the company that the salesman really was knowing what he was doing to bid the small machine. He had to, he, we forced him to justify bidding the smallest machine. But that was a real problem with the 360. That's intriguing. Could you pass the mic back to this gentleman, please? So I have a question. I mean, the 360 is interesting and all, but the quotes that you had at the end about fear being a motivator and being one of the most powerful motivators of the guy running IBM, I'm just wondering, how do you keep that as a motivator and keep it from becoming a demoralizer? Because I've seen it happen in a lot of companies where people just get very, they're scared, but they feel like they can't move. Let me refer to Andy's book, Only the, Par Only the Paranoid Survive. In that book, he says, uh, he cites um, um, Peter Drucker as saying that the, the, the role of the manager is to banish fear from the organization. This is the passage in the book, and I'm, I'm speaking directly to the issue that you raised. Um, he said, I don't believe that's true, but I think there are two kinds of fear. There's the fear of speaking truth to power. And if you have that kind of fear, then you've got an, an organization that is hopeless. So it's not an accident that IBM in its great days had contention management. And at Intel, under Andy, it was called constructive confrontation. And uh, there was always plenty of confrontation. How constructive it was, we'll let the Intel uh, grads uh, say. But um, Andy did want to create a world at Intel where the person and the idea were not stapled to one another. Now, how true this actually was in practice, I'll let the people who worked there decide. But certainly the idea was that we argue over principles, not about the people propounding them. And then we just heard this this morning, actually, when we, we did a, were doing a project on 386. Once you have been heard, the idea, you know, Andy was a refugee from communist Hungary, and he wanted a company where there was going to be freedom of speech. And once you were heard, even if you disagreed, you then committed. Disagree and then commit was part of Intel culture. And that's also part of the Evans-Brooks story. Brooks may have disagreed, but then committed. So there's a certain similarity, it seems to me, to the IBM of the, the era of 360 and Intel to the era of Andy Grove. And that's the best fear response that I can give. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, my name is George Yao. I'm a software engineer. Uh, I think the web page is the most uh, significant uh, technology innovation uh, since uh, 15 years ago in 1993. But after the web page, it seems to me the technology innovation suddenly stopped. Uh, I wonder if you or anybody uh, uh, sitting here can tell us what's the most uh, significant technology innovation in recent 15 years. That's a tough question. Go ahead. Take that ball and run with it. 
In the last 15 years, I actually have a really strong opinion on this. I mean, I believe that it has to do with the open source stuff that's been happening since 91, since 85. Um, there was a strong culture of it back in the heyday of IBM and, you know, in the 70s. And I think that it's something that's putting a lot of pressure on a lot of companies to improve their products or die. And, I mean, I think that it's caused a lot of competition. I think that, you know, of course the... Well, that that's what I'm saying, though. I mean, you know, the Internet became really big, and open source didn't really become big until... Uh, you know, the late 90s. So, I mean, I think that it's representing, I mean, Google's based on open source. You know, there's a lot of, you know, Yahoo uses a lot of open source. But that's what they base all their services on. I mean, they, they base it all Here on we got that, it. So. Uh, Judy, go ahead. Um, I think when you're talking about fear driving innovation, you should differentiate incremental in in innovation or execution, which a lot of what Intel was all about once they were into microprocessors. Actually, even the 360 was disruptive in architecture, but it was still in some ways uh, solving a problem that was already being solved in a new way. If you really want disruptive innovation or research type of innovation, it can't be motivated by fear because you have to be willing to fail. Because without being willing to fail, you will not get truly disruptive innovation. So I would argue that the companies and the country needs both. You need research where failure has to be perfectly fine or you just won't take paths and you will freeze up. And then you need the type of innovation which is motivated by fear of not finishing, which startups often need, or fear of competition, which drives you to find the right solution no matter what. And uh, so I, I would disagree that fear is the single driving factor. And I think the reason innovation has dried up over the last 15 years is we're not willing to take the risks, and we are afraid, and we're too afraid. And so I think that's why we've seen less disruptive innovation. John, I, th I think the answer is relax. <laughs> uh, Richard, thank you. Oh, thank, thank you, you very, very much. Thank you so much.